So my name is Valerie Bates. I'm the chair, most of y'all know, because we're old friends here of the Texas Tropical Trail region, and I am Plan B. So um, welcome. We had 58 persons that signed up for our eighth virtual event today. Our next virtual event will be held May the 18th. Programs will feature La Posada Resaca um, Plantation near Brownsville, the history of Fort Ringgold in Rio Grande City, a book review uh, called Water Woes, a history of Corpus Christi's water system by Jim Maloney, and Voices from the Past, the Making of Aransas County, celebrating their sesquicentennial. So uh, we're looking forward to that May 18th event. And the question came up before we got started, um, which is, um, when are we going to meet in person? Um, know this, that we are working in that direction, trying to come up with a plan. Um, and we all know how difficult that is, even in the best of circumstances, because we also need to be mindful of, of of the comfort level of our hosts and our guests. So we're working hard on that, looking forward to it someday. So grateful that y'all have joined us um, for this form of Plan B uh, on another virtual tour. So first up, I'd like to introduce Elva Serta, the founding director and currently managing director of the McAllen Heritage Center and uh, she's gonna be talking to us about the updates, accomplishments, and what's happening at the McAllen Heritage Center in McAllen. So here is Elva's presentation. Good morning, everyone, and greetings from McAllen, Texas. Glad to be here this morning. And as luck would have it, we're having street construction right outside my window. So hopefully you're getting a good, you can hear me well and you're not hearing all that noise. Um, we're really pleased to be here today. We haven't been here for a while. And uh, as you said, yes, I am one of the founding uh, members that, that started up the museum. We chartered in 2006. And uh, after completing all the legwork, and those of you that have been involved in starting up anything know there's, there's quite a bit of legwork to be done. We were very lucky indeed to uh, be able to occupy this building that we're in, which is a, a landmark. Uh, it's the former post office located in downtown McAllen, built in 1934. Uh, it served as a post office for many years through the late 50s. And then it, it turned into kind of a respite center for downtown shoppers. It turned into city departments. And then it became the McAllen History Museum. And we've been here since mid 2008 doing quite a bit of work to the building. We love this building and we do all our best we can to preserve the building. And I'm very proud of our many accomplishments in our about 14 years plus of existence in McAllen and with the support that we have received, which has been phenomenal. Um, I believe my uh, our former board president, Dr. Nedra Kanark is in the audience today. She's also a current uh, board member emeritus. Another board member with us today is Olga Gabriel. <clears throat> wonderful uh, supportive board members. So um, with that, let's look at our presentation and then I will be happy to uh, do a short Q&A if time permits. And thank you again for having us here today. Hello and welcome to the McAllen Heritage Center. We're located in downtown McAllen, the corner of Main Street and Chicago in a historic landmark that was built in 1934 and was serving as the USPO, the post office here in McAllen. It served for many, many years before it was converted into a community center. Uh, and you know, it, it served for the downtown people to come in and, and take a break from shopping, etc., and for various city departments uh, before the museum uh, was offered the building in 2006 when we were chartered. Um, we opened our doors as you're coming through right now. Those are brand new front doors that I'm gonna brag about. Uh, and there's our reception desk. Uh, we moved in in 2008 into this portion of the building that you're now entering. And that was all of the building that we had. This area that we're going into is really special exhibits um, that you're gonna see. And those don't typically rotate, although some of them can. The middle exhibit that we're looking at now is our current special exhibit, Vaquero, Genesis of a Texas Cowboy. 
we're turning right in here into a permanent display area which is the chronological history of McAllen, Texas. It goes by decade. And as a matter of fact, we're getting ready to expand that area. And uh, people do spend quite a bit of time here. We are working on developing a self-guided audio tour. And there is Vaquero that I was just talking about right now. That is on loan from Humanities Texas. And that will be leaving our museum uh, in late April, unfortunately. It's been a very popular exhibit. And right there you see a replica of the cowboy uh, with his uh, hat, well-worn hat, bandana. That is a museum of South Texas history that collaborated with us with a beautiful case display, Ranch Life in Hidalgo County after 1850 by Emilia Junior Ramirez. Also some um, artifacts. There is a beautiful cowboy horse saddle that was uh, loaned to us by a local collector, Hector Vargas, uh, also a historical family. The display is several panels uh, telling a story and it is bilingual. I highly recommend this. People have really enjoyed it. And it depicts cowboy life in Northern Mexico. I love to hear the coyotes yipping at night. There's a quote there. And the photos are all in black and white. So people do spend time viewing those. This is a rotating exhibit that we haven't not rotated. It's, it's, it is uh, to honor impactful uh, regional uh, people. And this one is for country Roland Garcia who had a country band that was known for Tejano um, type country music. He was also a fire chief in the city of McAllen for many, many years before he retired. He was an award-winning, he's beloved. When we did the, the opening for this exhibit, we had standing room only, people standing in the sidewalks to get in. Here is our, our refurbished tiendita, our museum store. We have recently gone online with this, been a big, big project for us to undertake, and uh, we're still tweaking it today. People can go in there and buy all these items, uh, and we're adding more uh, daily because we wanna make sure we have an excellent inventory historical books and other items and then also uh, fun items about uh, our city that that can be found here uh, for purchase so we want to our, our tagline really is here you can come find everything McAllen there's a, a postcard and that was an actually a, a retro postcard there is another shot of the store with, of course, your usual t-shirts, some bolos that were donated to us. They're very, very, uh, they're not new. Let me put it to you that way. There's our centennial pins when we celebrated our 100th birthday in 2004. And again, many other items. Uh, like I said, we have various historical books, photography books from Valley Land Fund. And here's some fun magnets, a little taco magnet with McAllen, Texas on there. A cowboy hat, a, a license plate, the famous palm trees and those sell quite well here in downtown McAllen people really love buying those art panels done by local tile artist Yolanda Cantu when we did our renovation this is the emblem of the city and our bird this is the uh, first train depot our building in the middle and the Casa de Palmas hotel along with the former city logo all done in broke tile, broken tiles. Beautiful, and uh, she is very talented. And those mark the entries to the newly renovated area that we completed with a grant from the development corporation that we sought and won. Here you're going into our uh, new, it's a multi-purpose room, which actually used to be the women's restroom. It was really outdated and dire need of repair. We completely renovated it. Uh, we left some of the walls just to depict more historical aspect to the building. There's a mural of pictures. Here's a lot of the uh, proclamations the museum has received from the city. And uh, that table can be folded in case we have another display we need for the room. So here you see the train cases, uh, which were built by Valley Rails and they depict the train stations because that's uh, how the city was founded in 1904. And then there's some artifacts from the train uh, club as well. And then as you exit, there is a panel display of the McAllen train stations 
to complete uh, the function of that room, which again is a multi-purpose. The entries again to the new areas, um, the tile art, a newly refurbished or newly remodeled restroom facilities. There's a before shot. Uh, they were not in good condition. They needed quite a bit of repair. We did repurpose the marble and most of the flooring. The ladies' restroom right there, uh, most of them were out of order at that time. So we were very happy to get this grant that we sought and won. Uh, here's again a wall depicting uh, layers of history uh, that looks actually quite beautiful in the ladies' restroom with that beautiful marble and coming out of the room we also put laundry facilities in the men's restroom which we use for whenever we have events we can wash our own linens etc uh, it's very convenient there's the tile artwork again depicting the city logo new city logo the hibiscus and the green jay the city bird the 2021 chuck wagon dinner is our major annual fundraiser Wonderful event, uh, dinner ticket, uh, and uh, we used to do it on premises, but it got too big, and the fire marshal told us we couldn't do it anymore here, too many people. We moved uh, off-site to Tony Roma's, and this year moving to Macaroni Grill. Same great meal and, gra and management team supporting the history of McAllen. Uh, there's a shot of the board uh, for a promotional. We're very proud to be selling them online. Uh, you get a QR code, again, joining the 21st century. We're very proud of that. And um, it's going well. Our newly refurbished website, also still in tweaking mode, but working well for us. And um, again, here is our online store, a big undertaking for us. And uh, it's again, working well. Uh, and we're still uh, adding uh, events. We hope to add many more events as uh, the, the uh, COVID gets, uh, gets behind us and things get better for everyone. We can go back to a more normal programming for the museum. Again, here's a page showing how to buy the tickets. I'm sure most people are familiar with online purchases by now, especially with this past year behind us. Our project, the video history project, uh, where we archive uh, history digitally, it was done here for the Harvey Drive Church of Christ, which closed its doors this past year in service in the community uh, for many, many years. Since 1928, we did a beautiful historical perspective, uh, included the um, church minister and elders. Uh, there he is, Abel Alvarez, who has now left the valley uh, to Abilene to work at Abilene Christian University. Um, by no coincidence, I'm a member of the church, or was, as my family was for many, many years. Beautiful ministry work done through this church. There is one of the uh, ministers from back in the 1960s and his family. Uh, a lot of the older members, again, all gone now. But uh, this is a former church building before moving to the new location, which now closed. And this building was repurposed by the city. Uh, the elders that participated and the minister told a beautiful story of the history of the church and their work. Uh, one member of the church also spoke on behalf of her family and their experiences. So we're very proud to keep that uh, here in our archives. That's actually a picture of my father who was a, an elder in the church for many years before he passed away. And there's Debbie Key, a church member, all in all, a beautiful video. We had a small reception to preview it, and uh, here it was well attended, as well as we could have uh, attendance. But uh, we're looking for more videos. Uh, we want to do 9 to 12 per year. We already have a waiting list. Uh, the next one would be Pioneer Physicians here uh, in McAllen. And there is a final overview drone shot of the facilities, which are probably going to be demolished. Uh, it's right across the, the street from a, an elementary school. And there's a picture of the participants, including yours truly. It was, uh, you know, really beautiful to be able to do this uh, for their for the church. And it, again, an ongoing project for us to preserve history in that format. Here is our commercial. Do you Enjoy. know the history of McAllen? The McAllen Heritage Center is a perfect place to go learn about the great history of the city of McAllen. You'll be able to view artifacts and memorabilia from different eras. Feel free to contact us and ask about our private tours. 
We've also added a great new video tour, which is presented by in-house historian Spud Brown. We really hope to see you soon. Bring the family along. It's always fun to learn about history. Been a pleasure. Thank y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed that. Um, thanks so much, Elva. Elvia, well done. Um, does anybody Thank have you. any questions? Thank y'all. It was fun doing the video um, for y'all. Uh, Valerie, I have a question. I had typed it into the chat, but I'll just ask it. Um, how is that museum funded? I mean, I saw so many uh, costly renovations and so forth. Where, how do you get money to do that? Great question. We write for, for grants, I'm sure like most of y'all do. And that's how we funded the renovations through a grant from the Development Corporation and many other grants that we write for. Basically, I take care of that for the museum. Well, it's just beautiful and congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate hearing that. We're very proud of our museum. Come see us. Next time you come to McAllen, please make plans. Just check in with me. And um, we are going to be uh, working with Nancy to offer a tour uh, later on. So. I just want to say I, I work with the Texas Historical Commission. I'm from Harlingen, actually. Um, and I've never been there before. And I can't believe I haven't been there. It looks absolutely you know. beautiful. <laughs> I know. You. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> But Thank it looks you. so beautiful. Those renovations are really stunning. Um, I was wondering, has there been any interest? I mean, I know it's difficult with COVID, but um, ha has there been any interest from the young community? Is there Are there any particular initiatives that have reached them um, or done a better job at reaching them? Have they expressed interest in these renovations at all? Yeah, we, we have a mix of, of the youth that attend and we're, we, like I said, we have recently really ramped up our social media, which is one way that we are improving that demographic, but it's surprising that uh, we, we, we miss out is on the field trips. We host quite a few field trips throughout the year, which we can no longer do and we won't be doing that for a while, but through our social media, we're doing a much better reach. And uh, when they come in here, they really enjoy some of the exhibits, except uh, especially the restaurant exhibit that we have in house that shows the menu items that were 90 cents for a plate of enchiladas or whatever. And, uh, and the telephone exhibit, which they tell me those phones couldn't be for real, those phones can't work. <laughs> so they only know about this. So anyway, yes, um, we're working really hard to bring in the younger group. And I think our little store is doing that as well for us. And we're trying hard to do, to reach them. Thank you for the question and come see us. I will. Uh, well, we look forward to a future visit for sure. I know some of us will remember the last time we were there, um, which was uh, around a Christmas time, I believe. So it's probably a November event, but uh, we look, and that's been a long time ago. So we look forward to coming back and um, um, touring your museum in, in, in person. Is that when we had the luncheon over at the chamber for y'all? Yes. We had tamales. Yes. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> yeah, tamales, great performances. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we put it all out there for you. Great. Yeah. The whole day's worth of adventure. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for quality a quality presentation. Um, so um, uh, we've lost Nancy again. Or she's oh, on I'm here. Oh, oh, hey. Oh, Did wow. You up or what? Thank you. <laughs> Nancy, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. My internet isn't giving me problems, but I am here briefly, hopefully for the whole event, but here I am. So uh, I, uh, I can go ahead while I can, if you like, Valerie. Yes, go ahead. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nancy Devinney. I'm the executive director of the Tropical Trail Region. I live on Lake Corpus Christi in Live Oak County. Welcome to our event today. Our next presenter is going to be Lourdes Trevino Cantu, who is the curator, docent, and office manager of the Heritage Museum at Falfurius. She's going to uh, show us a great tour of uh, the Texas Rangers room at their museum. Lourdes, please take it away. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, then I'm doing something right. Um, 
I'm here representing the Heritage Museum at Balfourius Inc. Ranger Room. Uh, I'm excited to be part of this virtual tour. Now, although this presentation features only the range of Texas Ranger Room, there's so much more to see at the museum. We have a lot of artifacts, antiques, um, memorabilia, and I hope that you all will come and visit in person someday. Right now, we're taking tours by appointment uh, as an extra precaution for um, COVID um, situation. Uh, I thank you, Nancy, and the Tro Texas Tropical Trail Region uh, for um, inviting me to be a part of it. And I hope you'll find my presentation interesting despite my camera shyness. Welcome to the Ranger Room at the Heritage Museum at Fafris, Inc. My name is Lourdes Trevino Cantu, and I've been a volunteer at the museum for over 20 years. I am currently the curator, docent, and office manager. I'd like to start this virtual tour with a historical note. Over 100 years ago, the Texas Rangers were a shield between the pioneer settlers and a hostile land. Falkbergus was a shield with Company D, Texas Rangers, stationed here as an area headquarter. Many Rangers settled in this area, and because of their contribution to the settlement of this territory, the Ranger Museum Association was organized in 1965 with over 400 charter members many of whom were descendants of Texas Rangers. In April of 1967, the Ranger Museum opened its door and was housed in a room within the Valfrias Chamber of Commerce building. After the Texas State Ranger Museum in Waco and another Ranger Museum in San Antonio were established, the museum changed its name to the Heritage Museum Association of Valfrias, Texas, Inc. A new home for the Heritage Museum was built on North St. Mary Street, and it opened in early 1976 in this present site, 515 North St. Mary Street. And the name was changed to the Heritage Museum at Fafridis Inc. Ranger Room. This Ranger Room features original guns, uniform, records, personal memorabilia, pictures, and stories of famous Texas Rangers. Follow me to the most interesting displays of the Texas Rangers. The Texas Ranger Room is dedicated to the Texas Rangers and their role in the history of Brooks County, which was named for a famous Ranger, Captain James Abijah Brooks. And I'm standing in front of his full length portrait painted and donated to the Ranger Room for permanent display by the artist Wayne C. Hornsby on October 20th in 1967. Right next to his portrait is a picture of him and a little bio that reads James Abijah Brooks, November 20th, 1855, died January 15, 1944. He was born in Kentucky and came to Texas in 1876. He became a trail driver and rancher. He became a Texas Ranger in 1882, received his commission as a captain in 1888. In 1900, he met and married Miss Virginia Wilburn. Of this union were born three children, Vernon Scott, Corrine, and John Morgan Brooks. After 25 years of service to the Texas Rangers, he resigned to run his ranch in Hidalgo County. At considerable sacrifice to his personal interests, he consented to run for the legislature. Few men enjoyed the esteem of so wide a circle of friends. During Brooks' tenure in the legislature, he managed to get the problems of the Valfrias area brought before the House with the help of his neighbors the signers of the original document. His platform was clean politics and a new county for Falfurius. He served from 1909 to 1912 in the state legislature. 
He helped to create Brooks County, which received his name. And during his illustrious lifetime, he served as Texas Ranger Captain, Deputy Sheriff, Hidalgo Legislator, and a County Judge of Brooks County from 1911 to 1944. These are the five pages of the resolution handwritten, handwritten by Captain Brooks using brown paper and pencil. It is the original draft and he was instrumental in introducing this resolution to form the county of Brooks, which then was named after him when he was successful. Uh, up here, you'll see a frame and they are uh, original railroad passes issued to Ranger Captain Brooks dated 1905 through 1906. There's also a Western Union Telegraph credit card dated 1906. Uh, this next frame is a list and it says muster and payroll of captains and that was dated 1870 through 1870. Right here is a picture of a company of Texas Rangers that shows Captain Brooks seated right here in the middle. And also this over here is a listing of all the Texas Rangers with Company A, Company B, Company C, Company D, Company E, Company F. And as we scroll down the list uh, of the, uh, the uh, Texas Rangers, they are listed in alphabetical order. Oh, when, uh, when they first opened the, the Ranger Museum um, in 1967, I believe this list was compiled in 1970. Next, I'd like to point out to you these four wall plaques with bronze design. And these are Texas Rangers uh, who have, who are very le legend, uh, excuse me, who are very legendary. And I just want to point out one of them, uh, who is Captain W.J. Bill McDonald. Quote, the most flamboyantly courageous man the Rangers ever employed. Bill McDonald was a compatriot of three great turn-of-the-century Ranger captains, John R. Hughes, J.A. Brooks, and J.H. Rogers. McDonald and these three men led the Rangers through some of their toughest campaigns. Once in Corpus Christi, he walked head-on into the guns of 20 black soldiers who were holding a barricade. Armed with only a double barrel gun, he convinced all 20 to surrender without a shot being fired. One of McDonald's best remembered adventures concerned a rough and tumble Texas town that was having a lot of trouble with an unruly mob. One of, as McDonald rode into town alone, one of the townsmen asked, where's your help, Bill? Whereupon McDonald answered coolly that he didn't need any help since there was only one riot. Henceforth, one riot, one ranger became a common ranger motto. In this case, we have the original gun collection belonging to Captain Brooks. Among them are this, this, is this Mauser in this wooden case. And this automatic action gun was owned by Captain Brooks when he was in Laredo, Texas. The black handle single army Colt was used by Captain Brooks. He gave the gun to his wife who carried it for protection when alone. This other gun was found by Captain Brooks and it has notched wooden handle one with one cross denoting possibly the demise of the former owner's victims. Now we come to my favorite Texas Ranger display, and that belongs to Texas Ranger Gus T. Buster Jones. 
Unfortunately, the glare from the lights might uh, not make the pictures and the artifacts uh, very visible, um, but I still would like to point out to you his pictures that are, are from age 16, the Spanish-American War age, all the way to where he was with the FBI and the U.S. Department of Justice from age 34 to 54. Right under the personal pictures, you will see this cane. That cane was given to Gusty Jones for protection during the time that he represented the FBI as an attache to the American Embassy in Mexico. It was donated by his wife. That cane is actually a weapon. And if you'll note the trigger me mechanism near the handle of her left, the shell chamber shown open next to the disappearing trigger, and the bottom part of the cane is the gun barrel disguised to resemble wood. There is a very valuable revolver there, and it is a silver-plated, pearl-handled Colt 45. It has it features his gold initials G T J on the handle, which stand for Gusty Jones, and he was a famous Texas Ranger and federal lawman. The other side of the pearl handle has the emblem of the Texas Ranger. The revolver has embossed scroll work, which this gun was custom made exact for Gusty Jones. And I contacted uh, several gun collectors and asked them if they could more or less tell me the value of the gun. And one collector said that it was valued at about $12,000, while another gun expert said it was no less than $35,000. And it's attributed to, be, to the uh, value because of his uh, role in the capture of Machine Gun Kelly. Uh, he also escorted Al Capone to prison. Uh, he was uh, part of the law enforcement who captured Machine Gun Kelly uh, during the kidnapping of Charles F. Urschel. Uh, down here there are um, documents and medals and um, memorabilia that belong to uh, Gus T. Jones. And again, I apologize for the glare, but I hope you can see the, this artifacts belong to Lake Newell Porter. Uh, he was born in 1854 and he died in 1945. He was elected sheriff of Brooks County and served from 1919 to 1922. He was famous for his fiddle playing as he rode the Chisholm Trail on cattle drives. His portrait hangs in the Library of Congress with six of his fiddle recordings. He was organizer of the Trail Drivers Association. In 1883, he was elected sheriff of McMullen County, where he served for eight years. Mr. Porter and his family moved to Valfrias, and he was elected sheriff in 1919. His grandchildren, Matt Hooger and Doris Porter, donated his artifacts to the museum in his memory for permanent display. And I hope you can see the fiddle his holster and a revolver, a rifle, and down in that corner is his hat. The Heritage Museum Ranger Room is the preservation storage of more than a hundred Texas Ranger boots, among them the legendary Bigfoot Wallace. This wall display is dedicated to past and present Texas Rangers. Uh, of course, they were, some of began with the Department of Public Safety. As we move down this way, the most current pictures of the most current uh, Texas Rangers uh, are shown. Uh, we have had these pictures donated by Texas Rangers or former Texas Ranger and right here, in this one right here, this was donated by Texas Ranger Ustasio Balvan, 
while he was stationed here in Valfrias. He has since retired and moved to West Texas. Uh, but we do appreciate all the donations, um, the trust that families put um, in the Heritage Museum to preserve and display these precious uh, historical artifacts. This concludes our virtual tour of the Heritage Museum at Falfurius Ranger Room. I hope you have enjoyed the virtual visit and on behalf of the Heritage Museum Board of Directors and the City of Falfurius, thank you to the Texas Tropical Trail Organization for allowing us to be a part of today's virtual tours. In closing, I would like to mention that the Heritage Museum and Ranger Room is funded in greater part by the City of Falfurius Hotel Motel Tax Fund. We invite everyone to come visit our museum and stay in any of our local hotels or motels because just one day of visiting is not enough to see the many interesting and historical displays of the Heritage Museum at Fall Furious. Again, thank you for allowing me to conduct this tour. Thank you, Lourdes, so much. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Nancy, I'd like to make a comment. Um, in Lourdes's uh, introduction, she's she's got um, curator, docent, office manager, and then adds volunteer. And I can't think of a better illustration of where everybody's at in these small museums, and it needs to be recognized. So many hats on one person to make these things happen. And it's, it's really, uh, you have to be passionate about it. You have to love what you do. Uh, Lord, as it shows, um, you're, you're doing your, your town and your history uh, proud with keeping this alive. Thank you so much. Appreciate the comment. It hasn't been easy, especially with this younger generation that just doesn't seem to be interested uh, or understand the value of uh, preservation of historical memorabilia. Um, and it's, it's been hard. It's really kind of been a one man show, but. but. You know, the good news is we all used to be the younger generation. Yeah, hopefully. And we're all here now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank the good Lord. And thank you all so much for your attention to my presentation. Again, I apologize for my awkwardness and my camera shyness. It was a first for me, but I hope I can do this again, Miss Nancy. Uh, because I would love to show so much more that we have in the museum. Thank you. Thank you. We'll certainly take you up on that. And we also, also want to mention that her husband is a videographer, and he also did this as a volunteer. He created this video for us today. Yes. Yes. I, Cesar Cantu. I have to give him a lot of credit because he had Thank a you. lot of patience. And Thank you. You did a great job. You did a great and job. Thank you. In anticipation of uh, Commissioner Burdett's question the, on the last presentation about where does funding come from, and we're always curious about that. And Lourdes, you added that on the end of your um, presentation. So um, yeah. you know, it's important to recognize our partners, and we all want to know what the secret is to keep these things going. Well, the requirement for the city uh, hotel motel funding. Um, has always been that you advertise the city, that you advertise the hotel motel, um, that you plan events, um, and that you uh, invite people to come stay at the hotels and the motels if you are um, getting that kind of funding. Thank you, we appreciate it. And we're gonna move on to our next program. And it's going to be uh, somewhat of a follow-up of, of last month's program with the relocation of the Klein's Cafe building in Rockport. And today we have with us Pam Stranahan from the Aransas County History Center and Louise Puran from the Rockport Center for the Arts. And they're both combining a couple of programs to tell us what's happened now that the building has been moved and what's going to happen to the space that it vacated. So Pam and Luis, would you please move on with your program? Uh, thank you. We're uh, at separate locations. So here I am. Uh, what our story is going to be about is what Klein's Cafe has been over the years. So I'll be talking about the many different 
uh, cafes that have been located in this building. It's known as a Klein's Cafe because that was one of the most popular eating spots in town and the Klein's ran it for over 30 years. So uh, much of what I'll be talking about today comes from our book called Foodways, which was uh, published by the History Center and available from the History Center. Hi, I'm Pam Stranahan, currently president of the History Center for Aransas County. Today, we're gonna to talk about the Klein's Cafe building and its move. So joining me in a little bit will be Louis Brown from the Rockport Center for the Arts. But let me tell you about the history of the Klein's Cafe and all that went along with it, starting in Rockport, actually in the 1920s and 30s. This Klein's Cafe is an Art Deco style building that was popular in the 1930s and 40s. The streamlined facade was used across the country for diners, filling stations, and motels. This building has a flat roof, smooth stucco walls, curved corners, and glass block windows. The parapet is heightened above the central doors and again above the corners. Below the parapet is a raised string course, which tops a horizontal band of concave circles. These once covered lights that shrimpers used to guide them home. A total of six vertical lines of black tile rise from the horizontal, from the string course with three per curved corner. The cantilevered stepped arch canopy is over a recessed entry. Curved walls and glass blocks flank the front doors. The stucco around all the window openings is rounded at the top corner edges. These are all characteristics of the Art Deco style. The structure was built in 1942 on this location after a fire had destroyed the previous cafe. The builder was A.O. Freeman, who also built the Brock Building, which housed the post office across the street. Freeman's son recalled that since materials were in short supply during the war years, his father used concrete blocks that he had found around the community. Now, this location was known for its restaurants beginning in the 1930s. Marvin Davis, who had previously owned a cafe in the south end of town, built a place here at 106 South Austin, where he sold cold drinks. And he added alcoholic beverages when liquor licenses were available. He sold beer to go to folks going to the dance hall in the Brock building across the street. Davis also had slot machines and marble games until 1939 when the county was cleaned up. Jack and Pearl Davis, Marvin's brother, took over the restaurant and added a grill with hamburgers. Jack was captain of a tugboat that ferried visitors and goods to Matagorder Island for Toddy Lee Wynn. Pearl operated a two-way radio from home on Live Oak Street because there were no phones on the island. The restaurant was renamed Cap Davis's Drive-In when Charlie and Molly Davis bought the cafe. It had a unique car hop service. And it was Molly Davis who had the cafe rebuilt in 1942, after the fire. The Davis family had been instrumental in the early development of this cafe. In, in a 1945 school annual, the cafe is advertised as Hinton's Cafe, although the Davis name remained on the building. Then for a while, Steve and Grace Theodore ran an establishment as Theo's Grill. In the 1960s, Shorty and Gloria Klein leased the building and operated Brocato's restaurant, but they advertised it as operated by Shorty and Gloria Klein. 
Later, they changed the name to Klein's Cafe. When the Kleins took over the operation, Shorty was still working in Sea Drift at Union Carbide, so he and Gloria shared the duties. The cafe was a very busy place, with fishermen and guides coming for breakfast at 5.30 a.m., businessmen having coffee and conferences, and other patrons favoring Mrs. Ritchie's homemade pies. The Kleins operated the cafe for more than 30 years. It was an Austin Street institution, popular with locals and tourists alike. To quote, to quote a review from the Corpus Christi Caller Times, the tables filled up willy-nilly with gossipy buzz prevailed. The coffee's good, as it must be in such an institution. The eggs over easy are faultless and the unorthodox huevos rancheros will knock your waiters off. The property was bought from the Kleins around 2002, then leased to numerous tenants. It was a Felder Art Gallery in 2004, La Luna Restaurant in 2011, a barbecue cafe, and winery by the bay in 2013. In July of 2016, the Rockport Center for the Arts acquired the land in downtown Rockport for a planned expansion. The land contained the beloved historic asset, Klein's Cafe building. The building was damaged by Hurricane Harvey in August of 2017, but it was restored and swung into operation as the new Center for the Arts space because its former home on Aransas Bay was a total loss successful capital campaign raised matching funds that allowed the Center for the Arts to obtain disaster recovery funding from the federal government. The land under the building was needed for an ambitious 22,000 square foot development in the heart of downtown Rockport. Citizens, supporters of the arts, and local history organizations assisted the Center for the Arts with a plan to save the building by moving it. Spearheaded by the Center for the Arts, negotiations for the relocation process took most of 2020 to mature. The building and site preparation started in late November of 2020. By January 2021, the building was elevated in preparation for the move. Then on March 31st, 2021, Rockport Center for the Arts successfully and safely recloaded relocated the historic Kleins building from 106 South Austin Street to a location only four blocks away at 504 South Magnolia Street. The total cost of the Kleins Cafe building relocation contract between the Center for the Arts and Ram House Movers was approximately $200,000. It was paid for with private funding, with the Center for the Arts covering 55% of the lo total lo relocation cost. The balance was paid for by Upside Ventures. Once the building is off the Ram House Movers equipment, probably April of 2021, and on the new foundation, the ownership of clients will transfer from the Center for the Arts to Upside Ventures. The Aransas County Historic Commission will apply for a subject marker and the Center for the Arts will place an interpretive sign with the history and photos at the site. Hello, friends of the Texas Tropical Trail. My name is Luis Puron. I'm the Executive Director of Rockport Center for the Arts. I'd like to thank Pam uh, Stranahan for such an insightful uh, look at the history of the Klein's Cafe building, which was recently relocated. Thank you, Pam. And uh, I would like now I would like to now show you what it is that we are going to be building in the downtown area. Uh, I'll start with a little uh, historical perspective on our project. Uh, basically, before Hurricane Harvey, we were already planning for a major expansion, and in 2016, as Pam said earlier. 
uh, we purchased about a 1.2 acre tract of land in the downtown area, specifically on uh, South Austin Street at the corner of North. Uh, and then later that year, we also entered into a lease agreement with the city of Rockport to turn North Street into a pedestrian uh, walkway. The reason we did that is because we saw it uh, as very important uh, for us to be able to create a campus environment because what we actually did is we purchased two tracts of land, one on the north of uh, uh, North Street and the other one to the south of North Street. Uh, and <clears throat> the reason we wanted to have uh, to turn North Street into a pedestrian walkway is because we wanted to tie the one track to the other one with a sculpture garden, which will be a ma main feature of the designs that I'm going to be showing you in a few minutes. Our project is approximately $11 million, and that includes the land acquisition that we did in 2016. We added a little land to the project in, last year in the summer, about August of 2000. And 20 by uh, purchasing land from Rockport Harbor Fund LP. And uh, we also have uh, received uh, funding from the Texas General Land Office uh, that will allow us to have off site parking for our events. So, what we are building is basically uh, between 22 and 23,000 square feet of new and conditioned space. There will be three buildings on our properties. Uh, one of the, the main building is the arts complex that will house our visual arts and our art education programming. It will also be the home to our administration office. The second building on the art complex side is a standalone one story building that it will become our clay studio. And then on the north side of North Street, we are building a performing arts and convention center. As I said, the total construction or real estate development uh, for this project is approximately 11 million. So now let me show you some pictures. What you see here is the actual site plan for the construction. Um, you see uh, on the left part of this image is South Austin Street. And what you see towards the center of the two buildings that are uh, positioned on top of the site uh, is North Street. And as you can see, we will maintain a um, emergency exit for emergency vehicles. So vehicles will be able to traverse through the middle of our property, but essentially uh, North Street will become closed to through traffic except for emergencies, as I said earlier. There's a, a lot of parking in the back towards the eastern uh, side of our lot. And then there's also parking that is street parking uh, on the left side along Austin Street uh, corridor. In this next slide, you're basically looking at our buildings. Uh, these are renders of our buildings from Austin Street towards the bay. And uh, what you see on the left is the Performing Arts and Convention Center. And then what you see on the right is a two-story uh, arts complex that will be, as I said earlier, house art education, visual arts, and administration. In this slide, uh, we are looking at additional details from an interior courtyard. The building that you see directly to your left is the arts complex, and you're looking at a magnificent sculpture park that is going to adorn uh, not only North Street, but also uh, will tie the campus together. And then in the background, you see the Performing Arts and Convention Center. And the Performing Arts and Convention Center will house programs such as performing arts, uh, media, literature, and culinary arts. It will be home to a culinary kitchen for instruction and learning. In this, this next image, you're looking from the Performing Arts Center towards the Arts Building. And the Arts Building, as you can see, is two stories. Um, the galleries will be on the second floor, as I will show you here in a floor plan, floor plan in a few minutes. Uh, there will be lots of lush plants that will adorn the sculpture garden as shown here in this render. Now we're looking at another uh, angle from the Performing Arts Center towards the arts uh, building. The second story of the arts building has light monitors. Uh, underneath those light monitors is basically going to be 
the main gallery, the largest of the three galleries that we will be part of our visual arts program. This is a terrific, really aerial view, looking from the northwest down into the campus. The primary buildings you see there, uh, you can really see the whole arts complex fully. And the arts complex uh, is two stories, as I've said earlier. And then you see a separate one-story building. That separate one-story building uh, will have a, a way to a promenade upstairs that you can move across to look at the bay. And that building, uh, standalone building itself, is the Clay Studio. To the very right of this image, you see the performing uh, arts complex, which is divided into uh, five spaces. The first uh, space is the culinary kitchen. The second space is a foyer. You have, um, as well as a bay of uh, bathrooms, and you have administrative offices, storage, and then the performing arts and convention center it itself. And I will show you in a few seconds uh, images of the floor plans for that space as well. Who we have uh, looking at the entire site, uh, looking from the east side uh, down in towards Austin Street. So this is a, a better render where you can really appreciate the entire the entirety of the complex. Uh, on the left side, that is the arts complex. On the right side, the performing arts uh, and convention center, which we call the PAC. You could see, appreciate a little better, the one-story building on the arts complex side that has a walking promenade that we are going, going to be using um, for events. And here is yet another render of the entire uh, facilities, um, the three buildings with the courtyards and sculpture garden that will tie everything together. The sculpture garden will be uh, the home for a portion of our permanent collection, uh, which is growing. Uh, we are working presently uh, on the development of a new sculpture that will adorn the downtown area. And um, this project, uh, the Rockport Center for the Arts, the Performing Arts Center is slated for completion on June of next year. We broke ground on February 23rd of this year. And just on Monday, we started uh, the actual construction uh, phase. In this, in this slide, you actually see the program, which is the first floor of a, the clay studio, which is to the right, and then B, uh, the arts complex, which is on the left. You see that we have galleries and three classrooms, a bay of bathrooms, storage area. There's an elevator that will get us from the first floor to the second floor. Uh, the entrance, there will be a large opening that will be the home to our a glass collection. And then on uh, offsite, you see a ceramics classroom that can be split into two. It's going to be the largest of our classrooms, a total of almost 1,600, 1,500 square feet. Uh, and so that will have, be the home for our printing program, basically the dirty arts, the clay studio, and uh, fused glass, etc. This is the second level. Obviously, there's on the clay studio, it's a, just a one-story building. So there you see the roof promenade, the terrace, that we will use for events. And then you see uh, two large galleries, much larger than we have ever enjoyed. You see a bay of stairwares, the elevator that gets you upstairs, additional storage, uh, staging for the storage because we will be doing traveling shows from different parts of the country. And then to the right of the bay of bathrooms, you see a kitchen, uh, basically a break room for the staff, a conference area for meetings, and then an open office area for our interns and our administrative assistant, and then a bay of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six total offices. Now let's look at the Performing Arts and Convention Center. As I told you earlier, there's uh, five or six spaces here. You have storage at the very top. You have a culinary arts kitchen. This will be for instruction and learning. You have a small bay uh, of offices and uh, then you have a bay of bathrooms and then an entrance foyer. Uh, this will be for ticket taking or for when we have a convention for directing the people to uh, the area to the right. 
which is a, a multi-purpose center. Um, it's you can't really appreciate it because I don't have a optic on this, but this is a very large open room. As you can see, it's almost 5,000 square feet, and this space will be able to be broken out so that we can have smaller meeting spaces or smaller conventions. And finally, this is a, I know this is a, a high degree of interest to our friends in the Texas Tropical Trail. Uh, this is the design for a sculpture garden. Uh, it was designed by Adla. Uh, he's our landscape architect. This is a very defined plan of the flora that will be a part of our sculpture garden. Uh, the, uh, the majority of the flora uh, that was adapted for this plan is to attract butterflies and birds. As uh, the Texas uh, Tropical Trail knows, uh, the Rockport area is a huge uh, bird migration area, and we wanted to make sure that our landscape design accommodated for these migrations of butterflies and of birds. Uh, there will be lots of sculptures. Uh, some of them have already been placed that were in our uh, sculpture garden on the bay, and then there's lots of room for increasing um, you know, the sculpture garden permanent collection. So this uh, is this uh, sculpture garden is really the crowning jewel of the entire design. The design was done by uh, Richter Architects for uh, the entire uh, arts complex. As you can see here, uh, it is being built by Teal Construction uh, Company. Uh, both companies are from Corpus Christi, Texas. Richter Architects is an award-winning uh, architect. Uh, the design is considered coastal contemporary, and uh, we're very excited about the future, our expansion of programs, and what we are going to be able to do, and uh, also housing such programs such as the Cinematic Arts. Uh, as many of you know, we host a annual um, film festival in the month of November that has been a wandering festival uh, for many, many years uh, in its 14-year history and it will finally have a home in these spaces. So uh, I would like to thank our friends at the Texas Tropical uh, Trail for participating in this exciting presentation. And uh, we hope that you will join us, that you'll consider having your annual meetings here in Rockport at our facilities. And I look forward to touring you personally. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Luis and Pam, and I know we're all excited about such a fantastic project, and it's going to be such a, a awesome project, and and buildings to enjoy and take advantage of in so many different uses. Are there any questions, comments by anyone? Valerie, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, well, I, one of the things I left in the chat is I, it's, you know, we turned our, our, our back, so to speak, because we've all been uh, quarantined on so many partners. And while we were, weren't watching, it's amazing <laughs> the amount of projects that have been nurtured throughout this process, throughout this uh, last, you know, 15 months or so. Um, very impressive and inspiring. So um, I can't wait to um, see some of these places in person. Um, and, I, and I need to add that uh, Commissioner Burdett um, had to leave our meeting. She texted me her apologies for not being able to say um, goodbye. We were happy to have her here for a little while, but she had an 11 o'clock Zoom meeting that she was hosting. So we're happy to have her support um, for however long she can give it. Thanks again, and if there's no comments, we're gonna move on to our next and final program for today. Uh, it's gonna to be uh, presented by Roseanne Baca Garza. She's the program director for the CHAPS program at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And CHAPS stands for Community Historical Archeology span Program with Schools. And She's also a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology at uh, UTRGV. And she's also very involved in the uh, program project Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail, which those of you who have been with us through the years have ha had the pleasure of listening to her 
uh, different programs about the project and also enjoying the project as well. So here she is today to tell us about the U.S. Colored Troops and Confederate Soldiers of Color in the Rio Grande Valley during the U.S. Civil War. Roseanne, I, I, please. I, I want to yes. just interrupt for a second. It is the award-winning Civil War Trail. Yes, just got um, an award at the Real Places Conference, so don't want to overlook that. A well-deserved award at that. So Roseanne, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today, uh, Nancy and the Texas Tropical Trails Group. Uh, it's always great to be with you. I always enjoy my time spent uh, with you and uh, your followers. Um, and I am looking very much forward to the day in the future that we all get to have the opportunity to get together very soon. Um, and since the other presenters did mention uh, how they got funding, um, I'll just take this opportunity to thank, um, you know, who's been funding our uh, CHAPS program and our projects throughout the years. Um, so we have the, uh, the provost office and the division of academic affairs and the College of Liberal Arts at UTRGV, which is where we're housed. Uh, but we do, just like the rest of the, the presenters today, have applied for, you know, multiple, multiple grants throughout the years. And we've been fortunate to get some from the Texas Historical Commission's Texas Preservation Trust Fund, uh, Humanities Texas, uh, the Summerlee Foundation and the Summerfield G. Roberts Foundation of Dallas. Uh, our program founding director, Russell Skoranek, is the endowed chair uh, professor uh, for the Houston Endowment for Hi Civic Engagement, um, and then various cities, the like city of Roma, city of Rio Grande City, uh, Brownsville Community in uh, Improvement Corporation, and then other um, in-kind wonderful donations from or assistance along the way from like the Museum of South Texas History, King Ranch Museum, Kennedy Ranch, Zapata County Historical Museum, Webb County Heritage Foundation. I could go on and on. We've been building a lot of wonderful friends along the way. And next month you are going to be working with the uh, Revive Fort Ringgold people and um, Colonel Barrera and his team out there in Rio Grande City. And so I, I know you're in for a wonderful presentation there and they've been great friends to us as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I like to go ahead and get started with this presentation. It's one of the uh, many assets we have with our Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail Project. And so um, I put together this abbreviated presentation of an hour long presentation I gave at the McGallan Public Library during Black History Month uh, a short time ago. So um, I hope you enjoy the presentation and feel free to ask questions um, if you have any. Hello everyone and welcome to today's presentation titled U.S. Color Troops and Confederate Soldiers of Color in the Rio Grande Valley during the U.S. Civil War. My name is Roseanne Bacha-Garza and I am a lecturer of anthropology and the CHAPS program manager here at UTRGV. In May of 1863, we had the formation of the United States Colored Troops by General Order Number 143. The U.S. Army established the 25th Corps of the U.S. Colored Troops with the enlistment of 180,000 men. This number represented 10 to 15 percent of the entire Union Army at that time. There were three regiments that first entered the Rio Grande Valley in the fall of 1864, the 67th, I'm sorry, the 62nd, the 87th, and the 91st. The 62nd U.S. Colored Infantry fought the Confederates at the last land battle of the U.S. Civil War at Palmito Ranch on May 13, 1865. I'll talk a little bit more about this regiment later on in the presentation. Once the U.S. Civil War was over in May of 1865, 
nearly 16,000 U.S. colored troop veterans of the 25th Corps arrived at Brazo Santiago from City Point, Virginia, in order to protect the region and to prevent former Confederates from establishing their defeated army and bringing the conflict back over from Mexico. These troops, along with their later successors, the Buffalo Soldiers, were responsible for patrolling the US-Mexico border for several decades. Their job was to stop ongoing violence in Mexico from spilling over the border into the US while Mexico was having its own civil war. And they were discouraging bandits and Native Americans from attacking civilian communities. The last regiment of U.S. colored troops stationed in the Rio Grande Valley during the U.S. Civil War, the 116th U.S. Colored Infantry, left the Rio Grande Valley in July of 1867. Initially named the 1st Missouri Colored, the 62nd had the distinction of being the first Black regiment organized in a border state. While stationed at Brazo Santiago, Lieutenant Colonel David Branson promoted education in a very severe manner, ordering any soldier caught playing cards to stand at a prominent position in the camp with a book in hand, reciting aloud to demonstrate his literacy. Harsh tactics like these must have worked because jobs that required heavy processing of army paperwork were filled with these black soldiers. Later, there was a fundraising campaign among US colored troop veterans for the establishment of a black university in Jefferson City. Former enlisted men of the 62nd collectively donated $4,000 for the cause, which culminated in the founding of Lincoln Institute later known as Lincoln University, in September of 1866. The school took its place beside Fisk, Howard, and other historically black colleges in elevating African Americans up from slavery, which is a Booker T. Washington's phrase. Thanks to the efforts of men whose own education were developed here in the Rio Grande Valley at Brazo Santiago. This map, which is a recreation of a previous map, shows where the 62nd US Colored Infantry was fighting at the Battle of Palmito Hill on May 13, 1865. Off to the upper right side of the map, you can see the direction in which White's Ranch, Boca Chica Pass, and Brazo Santiago is located. And these are the, the places where the US Union troops, including US color troops, were stationed uh, or camped in segregated campsites nearby. Did you know that following the US Civil War, African American troops rebuilt and served at Forts Brown, Ringgold, and McIntosh? Here in this slide, we have an image of the post hospital at Fort Ringgold in Rio Grande City and the bakery at Fort McIntosh in Laredo. These buildings were built or rebuilt during the reconstruction years after the Civil War was over. The image on the lower right hand side of the slide shows US color troops at Fort Brown's guardhouse in Brownsville. These troops rebuilt many buildings at Fort Brown, including the Morgue Building. Here also in the slide is Private William Wright of the 114th US Colored Infantry, who was present when Black infantry companies from the 19th and the 114th US Colored Infantry intervened in a dispute in Matamoros, crossed the Rio Grande over a hastily constructed pontoon bridge and secured order in the town while the last imperialist sympathizers clashed with Juarez's liberals. The company's commander, Colonel Thomas Sedgwick, 
was relieved of command and arrested for this action that violated army neutrality policy. Photograph, the photograph also shows a view of Levy Street in Brownsville. And this view comes from the pontoon bridge constructed by these US forces across the Rio Grande from the viewpoint of Matamoros, Mexico in November of 1866. It is worthy to note that although the pontoon bridge no longer exists, you can visit these buildings today at Fort Brown, Fort Ringgold, and Fort McIntosh. Fort Brown buildings cover the campuses of UTRGV and Texas Southmost College in Brownsville. Fort Ringgold, although is part of the Rio Grande City CISD, there is a nonprofit group there called Revive Fort Ringgold that conducts tours of the property. And Fort McIntosh in Laredo is part of the campus at Laredo Community College. African Americans understood that their service in the Union Army was a step toward freedom, citizenship, and equality. Here on this slide is a list of locations within the Rio Grande Valley of Texas where US colored troops were stationed or camped during the US Civil War. Here is where we transition into Confederate troops of color on the Rio Grande during the Civil War. This story cannot be, cannot be told without the mention of two pioneering biracial families that settled along the banks of the Rio Grande within the decade before the US Civil War. These families are known as the Weber family and the Jackson family. Both families include a white man married to an emancipated slave who had children together and formed loving family relationships. Both of these family ranch communities had licensed ferry landings on their property. Here in the center image of the, map, of the slide is a map of the Rio Grande that shows where the licensed ferry landings were during the US Civil War era. These two family compounds were located approximately four miles apart. The Jackson Ranch compound on the border of what we know today as San Juan and Far, and the Weber Ranch community was located on what at the at the border of Alamo and Donna. They both utilized their ferry landings to trade goods such as farmed produce and animal hides with steamships that traveled up and down the Rio Grande between Brownsville and Roma. At the ferry landings, they could easily shepherd runaway slaves who traveled through the region in search of freedom in Mexico. Family histories have been passed down through the generations, telling of both the Weber and the Jackson family's participation in underground railroad-like activity. So here's where we see the Confederate soldiers of color. Interestingly enough, there were several members of the Jackson family that had mustered into the Confederacy during the US Civil War. As Texas became a Confederate state in February of 1861, imagine how devastating it was for these two families to know that they were once again living in a slave state. Control of the Rio Grande Valley changed hands several times throughout the US Civil War between the Union and the Confederacy. In December of 1862, the Confederacy called to service regional ranchers and skilled horsemen to patrol the river. Several ranch owners mustered in. This included not only the Tejano ranchers, such as Sixto Dominguez, Pacifico Ochoa, Francisco Munguia, and Cristobal Leal, but some of the men at the Jackson Ranch as well. Abraham Rutledge was a white man who was in a family relationship with Matilda Hicks's daughter, Nancy, who was black. They had children together and both Abraham and, and their son Manless mustered in 
to Captain Thomas's company of partisan rangers. Samuel Singletary, the son of Emily Singletary, and grandson of Matilda Hicks, also had mustered in. Samuel was married to one of the Weber daughters. Jasper Biddy, who was married to Sarah Jane Weber, also mustered into this unit. These people clearly were not sympathetic to the Confederate cause and did not support the push to keep slavery alive. They themselves were either African-American or married to a black person. During that time, there were slave catchers in the region as well. Two in particular were Confederate Colonels John Ford and Santos Benavides. It is my theory that these Jackson and Weber family members mustered into this unit following the old adage of, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. This way they could have their finger on the pulse of what was happening in the region and know exactly when slave catchers were around and then slip their family members over the river to safety in Mexico. These men and the Tejano ranchers I previously mentioned were also landowners. And in the 1860 census, you can see them as owning property as well as uh, values for their possessions, such as cattle, horses, etc. This unit was only active between December of 1862 and March of 1863. But nonetheless, these family members mustered in so that they could protect themselves, their loved ones, and their property. So that is it for my presentation today. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please feel free to ask questions and I'll happily try to answer. In the meantime, for further information, you can go to our website at www.utrgv.edu slash Civil War dash trail or contact me at chaps at utrgv.edu. Please also like us on Facebook at utrgv chaps or Rio Grande Valley Civil War trail as we make several announcements with regard to upcoming events and presentations conducted by the CHAPS program. Thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you so much, Roseanne, for this really interesting program. Any questions from anyone? As you said, we will be having one of our programs next month from uh, uh, Fort Ringgold and we we'll look forward to learning more about the Civil War in Texas during that time. If there's no other questions or comments, I just pass would this like on to say one oh, thing. Yes. Okay. If you all, any of you are in the Westlaco area, uh, our Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail uh, Traveling Museum exhibit titled War and Peace on the Rio Grande, 1861 to 1867 is currently standing at South Texas College's Mid Valley Campus in Westlaco in their library. Uh, it was just standing in the Corpus Christi Museum of uh, Science and History for six months between June of 2020 until the end of March of 21. So we just moved it to Westlaco and there it'll be standing until the end of June and then it'll go on to the Mission uh, Museum of History down here in Mission, Texas. So uh, if any of you are around and interested in seeing the exhibit, please go visit. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to Valerie. Well, we thank everybody for joining us again today because we know you have a lot of choices of things to do. So we, we appreciate your support of our program, of our region's history, and all our partners. And uh, we're so very proud of how far we've come um, now on this seventh uh, virtual presentation. And everybody's just upping their game and we're all getting better at this and um, can't wait to see what the future holds. Um, we started a little thing to encourage you all to uh, participate in our surveys, which are, are important to us. That's how we get better. Um, last uh, month, we gave away tickets to the Port Isabel Lighthouse. This month, the McAllen Heritage Center has donated a guided tour for two to four persons as an incentive for folks to complete our post-event survey for April 20th. 
Spud Brown, McAllen historian, will lead this tour. So we ask that you um, uh, talk back to us and, um, and we appreciate your opinions. Uh, we do read them and discuss them, take them to heart. And now you have a chance to win a prize for that. Um, so we look forward to seeing everybody on the 18th of May for our next virtual presentation. Um, we're going to meet as a board next. And of course, always on the um, on our minds are how this is going to look going forward. Um, and to you folks who have been able to take advantage of these meetings because we have had a virtual meeting, uh, we are trying to figure out logistics so we can keep uh, a Zoom presentation going also. So if you can't make it to our meetings, you still get to um, join us in our adventure. So thanks everybody from the Tropical Trail region. We will see you next month.